اعوذ بالله اعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية امير المؤمنين ولائمة المعصومين عليهم السلام والحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله والحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحصي نعماه لا دون ولا يؤدي حقه المجتهدون الذي لا يدركه بعد الهمم ولا يناله غوص الفطن الذي ليس لصفته حد محدود ولا نعت موجود ولا وقت معدود ولا اجل ممدود فطر الخلائق بقدرته ونشر الرياح برحمته ووتد بالصخور ميدان ارضه ثم الصلاه والسلام على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين شفيع المذنبين حبيب اله العالمين بالقاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى محمد وعلى ال بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعنه الله على اعدائهم اجمعين من يوم عداوتهم الى يوم الدين اما بعد فقد قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الحكيم وهو اصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولكل امه اجل فاذا جاء اجلهم لا يستاخرون ساعه ولا يستقدمون امنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم محمد وعلى محمد اما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمه الله وبركاته اي بيجن ان ذا نيم اوف الله تبارك وتعالى ذير از نو داوت ذير از ديو تو هيز كايندنس اند جينيروسيتي ذات هي جيفز اس ذيز اوبورتونيتيز وير وي غادر ان ريمبرنس اند ان جلوريفيكيشن اوف هيم تبارك وتعالى Then we begin this sermon the way the commander of the faithful Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi ma afdalu salatu was salam alli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad would begin many of his sermons by saying usikum wa nafsi bi taqwallahi al azim i advise you and i advise myself to be god conscious god fearing and pious human beings uh, excuse my voice for today as much as you may clear your throat it won't help me clear my throat uh, <laughs> but uh, we have been discussing the subject of quranic eschatology uh, the subject of death and life after death as it appears in the holy quran and last week we began or we discussed the opening of our books in front of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala our kitab our books of deeds and at this time we said that our deeds will be exposed in front of god and it is the human tendency that when they are embarrassed or when they are exposed at first they take a defensive approach and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes in the holy quran as we will discuss some examples today how human beings will first begin to dispute and argue their deeds in front of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it is said that some will full on deny by actually swearing yeah by swearing to say ya allah this wasn't my actions allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah number 58 verse number 18 yawma yab'athuhum allah jami'a on the day when god will resurrect them all fa yahlifuna lahu kama yahlifuna lakum and they will swear to him as they swear to you wa yahsabuna annahum ala shay and they will imagine that they have a standing in front of god by that swearing yeah by god ya allah it wasn't me imagine yeah in this world we say wallahi and we said okay maybe allah says the way they used to swear to you they are swearing to me and imagine in this world we say wallah yeah by god we're talking to god 
And we're saying, by God, this wasn't me, God. Yeah? Imagine the arrogance of human beings to dispute in this way. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah, innahum humul kathibun. He says, but indeed they are liars. So you see that human beings will begin to first and foremost dispute their actions in front of God. And when they see that this disputing and arguing isn't having any effect, they will then begin to make excuses for their actions. Yeah? They will begin to blame others for their actions until the time will come when they will realize that there is no recourse here. There is nothing to do but to accept the situation that we are in and it is at this time when the book of deeds will be given to us. Today I want to take, <coughs> I want to discuss some of the examples Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us in the Holy Quran about how human beings will argue with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What are the positions that they're going to take? And I think that for us, if we reflect upon this, there are tremendous lessons here that we can take into our day-to-day -day lives. Two things that we will discuss in particular. The first is how human beings will blame shaitan for their actions. Yeah? They said, Ya Allah, it wasn't my fault. I was tempted by shaitan. Yeah? It was shaitan who made me do it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discusses this <coughs> very beautifully in surah number 14, verse number 22, where he says, وَقَالَ الشَّيْطَانِ لَمَّا قُضِيَ الْأَمْرِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَعَدَكُمْ وَعَدَ الْحَقِّ وَوَعَدْتُكُمْ فَاخْتَلَفْتُكُمْ 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 and when the matter has been decided, shaitan will say, Indeed, God made you a true promise. I also made a promise, but I betrayed you. Openly, shaitan will say, I betrayed you. Yeah? He says that I, however, I never had any power over you. Yeah? I lied to you. I had never had any power to you. I merely invited you and you responded to me. Yeah? This is the argument that shaitan will give. He says, then do not blame me. Blame yourselves on this day. Yeah? And this is something that's really fascinating, isn't it? Where even shaitan knows what he's doing is wrong and in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he'll say, God, I take no responsibility for their actions. Yeah? I invited them. They accepted the actions. And this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to make something very clear to us. That shaitan never forces us to do something. Yeah? Shaitan merely invites. It is we who accept the invitation of shaitan because of our desires and because of our wants of this world. Yeah? So you know, when, when we see ourselves in certain situations, right, that we may get an invitation to a mixed wedding, we may get an invitation to a wedding with music, we may get an invitation to many things. These are invitations, we don't have to accept them. Yeah? Because it is no excuse in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that whatever situation we find ourselves in, it is only very rarely where someone will force us to do something haram. Very rarely. The choice is always ours how we choose to respond. Do I make this business transaction or not? No one is forcing me to do it. Right? And this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes very clear about shaitan. That even shaitan on that day will say, I take no responsibility for their actions. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The second example we get in the Holy Quran, and there are many such examples of arguments. So the first and the biggest one that you know, oftentimes we rely upon, the shaitan. That's shaitan. Yeah? Shaitan's strong, there's no doubt about it, right? But at the same time, God has made us stronger. Yeah? He has made us stronger to deny shaitan. Oftentimes, you know, when I think about this, what comes to my mind always is part of the hikmah of Shahru Ramadan. You know, that in the month of Ramadan, out of 30 days out of a year, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us our strength. That if we can avoid water and food for 18 hours, yeah, shaitan's never an excuse for making us do something. We are strong individuals who have tremendous capacity within us. So the first excuse of shaitan, even shaitan says, I have nothing to do with them. The second excuse that many will give on this day is that the weak will blame, will blame the strong for misguiding them. 
Yeah? Those who are weak, those who are abased, um, those who did not have quote-unquote position and were merely sheep along the way and were not the herders, they will blame yeah, those who are strong and say it is they who misguided us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in surah number 34, verses 31 to 33. I'll just read the first ayah in Arabic and then I'll read the rest in English. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَوْ تَرَى إذ الظالمون موقفون عند ربهم يرجع بعضهم إلى بعض القول يقول الذين استضعفوا للذين استكبر تستكبروا استكبروا لو لا أنتم لكنا مؤمنين. Yeah? They say, but if you could see when the wrongdoers are made to stand before their Lord, how they will blame one another. Yeah? Those who had sinned will now begin to point fingers at one another. Those who are weak shall say to those who are in authority or those who are arrogant, had it not been for you, we would have been believers. Yeah? That it's your fault that we are not believers on this day. Right? The arrogant will reply to the weak, did we keep you from the guidance once it had come to you? Did we force you to drink it? Did we force you to smoke it? Did we force you to watch it? Yeah? The guidance had come to you. You knew halal and haram. You knew wajib and haram. Who forced you to do it? But the weak will respond. You see, now they're arguing with one another. It's very beautiful, yeah? where the Quran describes this. But the weak will respond to the arrogant. Rather, it was your plotting night and day when you ordered us to disbelieve in God and to set up equals to Him. And it was your constant peer pressure. Do it. Just do it. God is forgiving. God is merciful. Just do it. Yeah? It is because of this that we now have disbelieved. But they secretly, Allah says, filled with regret when they see their punishment. We shall place iron collars around the necks of those who disbelieved. Shall they not receive punishment for what they did, Allah says? Yeah? And you can't pass the buck to somebody else on this day. These refer to, you know, friends who are stronger willed than other friends. A spouse that may be stronger willed than another spouse. Yeah? A sibling that may be stronger willed than another sibling. Maybe our bosses who are telling us to make a shady business transaction and we find ourselves that we have no choice but to make this transaction. All of these things in our minds we can justify them. But when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment, there is no justification for this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my brothers and sisters, in this great book that has been given to us, has described for us that whatever justifications we make in our minds today have no bearing on the day of judgment. Have no bearing. And this is something I want to end with that I repeat quite often. And I believe this. That as we as adults... Right? We as sane adults, believing adults, should never, ever be sinning on purpose. Never, ever. Yeah? We know halal and haram. There is nothing mystery to us. Right? It muffles my mind how somebody as an adult would purposely do something haram. Right? Like purposely listen to music. Like purposely watch something inappropriate. Like purposely not wear hijab. Like purposely not keep a beard. While purposely backbite. All of these things we know are wajib. And yet we don't do it. Why don't we do it? Because we have found a way to justify that in our minds. Yeah? That God understands my plight. God understands this. No. On the day of judgment, God has made it very clear that there are no justifications that He will accept. And every wrongdoer will be held accountable for their actions. This is an awakening that is required in each and every one of us. And when we feel that spark of awakening, I swear we will find God closer to us than ever before. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. And may Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala hasten the return of our Imam. Wa akhiru da'wan and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahi rahman rahim Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad. Lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakun lahu kufu wa nahad. Sadaqallahu al-aliyyul azim.
أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله قاسم الجبارين مبير الظالمين مدرك الهاربين نكال الظالمين سريخ المستسرخين موضع حاجات الطالبين معتمد المؤمنين اللهم صل على خاتم النبيين وسيد المرسلين محمد وصل على سيد الوصيين أمير المؤمنين علي بن أبي طالب وصل على محمد وعلى محمد وصل على الصديقة الطاهرة فاطمة الزهراء سيدة نساء العالمين وصل على سبت الرحمة وإمامي الهدى الحسن والحسين سيد شباب أهل الجنة وما صل على محمد وصل على علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي والحجة القائم المهدي اللهم صل على علي محمد صلاة لا غاية لعددها ولا نهاية لمددها ولا نفاد لأمدها اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات وتابع بيننا وبينهم بالخيرات إنك مجيب دعوات إنك على كل شيء قدير اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد we are coming now to the end of 2016 <coughs> and uh, some may actually say Alhamdulillah to the end of 2016. It has been uh, a tremendously rough year on numerous fronts and I think that as we look at time in general and as the years have gone by, uh, we find that the catastrophes in our world and the turmoils that exist in our society keep on increasing. Uh, I'm not sure if we can accurately say that there is more turmoil today than there was 20, 30, 40 years ago. I don't think we can quantify that in that way. I think the reason why it feels like there is more turmoil and catastrophe is because of the availability of news today. Yeah? With 24-hour with constant news and with media, from so with social media, uh, we get news instantaneously that is happening throughout the world and thus it seems like there is a constant barrage of negativity and turmoil that we see in our society. Um, and we can see this both globally when we look at, for example, what is happening um, in Syria, in Yemen, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Nigeria, the list of countries, Myanmar, all of these countries we see tremendous difficulty that our brothers and sisters are going through and humanity as well is going through and then locally as well. We can't forget the, the challenges we are facing locally, um, especially with the rise in Islamophobia. Um, the rise in, in persecution and, and of guilt before any type of action has been committed really. And of course what's coming up now with the presidency of Trump in America, God knows what's going to be in store for Muslims uh, in this type of environment. But you know when we look at the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has described to us and has promised to us that there will be constant turmoil in this world. Yeah. There is going to be constant um, trials and tribulations. And one of my favorite verses in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Baq Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 214, He says, أَمْ حَسِبْتُمْ أَن تَدْخُلُوا الْجَنَّةَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ حَتَّى يَقُولُ الرَّسُولُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مَعَهُ 
متا نصر اللہ اللہ ان نصر اللہ قریب احسن تم اللہ سبحانہ وتعالی says do you suppose that you shall enter paradise that you shall enter jannah though there has not yet come to you the like of what came before you to those who came before you he says stress and distress befell them and they were convulsed yeah zulzilu they were shaken to their core until the apostle and the faithful who were with them cried out to god mata nasrullah when is the help of god at this time god said ala inna nasrullahi qareeb indeed the help of god is close you know what this verse tells us something very important that the moment God's help will come is that when we collectively as an ummah feel the pain of what is happening in the world around us today. Collectively, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it very clear. حَتَّى يَقُولُ الرَّسُولُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مَعَهُ yeah? That until the Prophet, the Apostle and those who believed with them. You see, if we live in a world where we see something happen in Syria and it doesn't shake me, doesn't convulse me, doesn't do this zulzilu that God is talking about, right? this zilzal, this quaking within my being, then I am not united with my brothers and sisters in different parts of the world. You understand the logic that God is bringing? One ummah, one body. Yeah? That when something happens to any part of the body, the entire body feels the pain of what is happening. And I believe that we as an ummah, right, have to soften our hearts enough to together feel the pain that when something happens in Myanmar, I cry in Canada. Yeah? That something happens to my brothers and sisters in America, I cry in Canada. And when we get to that level, where we feel that pain, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised His help immediately after that. Yeah? And that's something for us to think about and to reflect about. I want to end with, everyone likes to make New Year's resolutions. You know? And I know that in Islam we have Muharram is our New Year. But I think that God gives us many such opportunities to constantly revive um, our resolutions, really. And I was thinking that I think it'd be nice as a community if we do set some resolutions. Maybe I am three months off by Muharram, yeah? But I'd never too late, like I said. And I think that when we look at the resolutions that we need to make, there are two types of resolutions. There are what is considered to be physical, and then there are those that are metaphysical. There is a physical or material type of resolutions or changes we need to make. And then there are the spiritual type of changes that I think that if we try to do these things, we will find a more fruitful life. And of course, you and I will be the judge whether I do it or you do it. I cannot come to you to ask you to do it. But there are certain things that when we make these type of resolutions, both from the physical and the material, immaterial, the objective, of course, is twofold. One is to make sure that we have a better life in this world by these things that I'm trying to implement. But more importantly, that I am securing my akhirah with these resolutions that I am making. So I think that I just have a couple of thoughts and ideas. And again, this is something very valuable that we need to do with our families and our friends to see if we can help each other to make sure that we meet these resolutions. One of the things from the physical perspective that I think we can all do is that we can all allocate some part of our money for charity causes, for charitable causes. All of us can do this. It can be as little as a dollar a month. It can be as much as whatever we have in our bank accounts. But monthly, if we make a plan yeah, where I just donate, for example, $5 a month, come out of my bank account automatically. I won't even feel it, right? But if we can get into the habit of doing this, this will help us tremendously in Akhirah, yeah? where it will serve as a shade for us from that punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But think about how much benefit it can have for people in this world today. Yeah? So that's one of the things that I think all of us need to actively do it. Even if we're young, yeah? borrow money from your dad and give it in charity. Yeah? There's no problem with that at all. Second thing is we need to find time, to sp we need to spend more time with our families this year. Okay? We see that one of the biggest causes of why our children are, are going astray is because of a lack of parental guidance and involvement in their homes. 
the parents travel for work, they're out for so long, and then when they come back on the weekends or at nights, they're tired and they're exhausted. We have to find a way to, to, to juggle that schedule so that we give more time to our family because this is very valuable time. Right? Eventually our children will grow up, they will get married, and then we will regret not having spent time enough with them. So we take these opportunities to spend a little bit more time with our families. And the third thing that I'd like to talk about from the physical perspective is to participate more in the mosque. Yeah? We do a very good job of coming out on Fridays. But the rest of the times, we are not as accurate or we're not as punctual or regular as we should be when it comes to mosque. There is a certain benefit attached to coming to mosque that cannot be duplicated if I'm listening online at home. Yeah? The spirituality, the brotherhood, the camaraderie, all of these things are things that we need to make more time for. And when we make time for God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes time for us. This is the physical, very quickly spiritual. We need to try and connect with the Qur'an. I was surprised, yeah? I was truly surprised how long it has been bef since certain people have actually read the Qur'an. Sit down and read the Qur'an. Ask yourselves, when is the last time you read the Qur'an? Right? Not for an istikhara. Sat down and read the Qur'an. Right? Um, we need to make time for the Qur'an. One page a day. Dedicate, ask yourselves to do that. It'll take no more than three minutes. One page a day to read the Holy Qur'an. Find a way to build a relationship with the 12th Imam. Find a way. Yeah? Whether it is when you give that charity, you say, Ya Allah, this is from my Imam, it's not from me. Yeah? When you give to a cause, Ya Allah, this is from my Imam. When I'm going to bed, I say, Salamu alayka ya sahib al-zaman. Yeah? When I say that salam, the jawab is wajib of that salam. I have opened up a relationship with my Imam. Yeah? Build a relationship with the Imam. And lastly, aim and prepare to go for ziyarat this year. Yeah? For any ziyarat, whether you go to Iraq, whether you go to Iran, whether you go to Hijaz. Yeah? Wherever you go, but plan, try to save a little bit. You may not happen this year, but at least your niya was there to go. Yeah? Go for ziyarat. I think one of the biggest things that's missing in our lives is that we don't go for the ziyarat of our imams. Yeah? Or the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his family. If we build this relationship, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. If we can build this relationship with them, they will help us in everyday affairs of our lives. So try to do these things. And again, talk to your families, make certain resolutions. Yeah? Allah will accept them even if they're three months after Muharram. And He will help us, inshallah, to be on this path. Wa akhiru da'wan an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajeem. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصبر صدق الله العلي العظيم.